Today I want to try to do three things. Summarize, examine the trends for youth presenting for substance use treatment in Florida and how they compare to the rest of the United States. To summarize, the National Institute on Drug Abuse's current recommendations for providing evidence-based treatment to adolescents with substance use disorders and to illustrate the data behind these recommendations and why it is they came to recommend the things that they do. Let me start with just briefly some of the trends in Florida and how they compare to the United States. Using the latest data from the National Household Survey on Drug Use and Health and the treatment episode data, we can look at trends in Florida and compare them to the U.S. Of the 25 million adolescents in the United States aged 12 to 17, about 5.6% live in Florida. Of the 78,000 youth getting uh, publicly funded treatment, only about 3.9% get treatment. So it's sort of underrepresented in terms of that, and I'll show you the data in a minute. First concept that we've been talking about uh, throughout the conference is one of health disparities. And what you see here in the orange bar is the rates of a substance use disorder in three different age groups. And the little bitty blue bar you can barely see, that's the rate of treatment participation. So the first thing you want to realize is, is that adolescence is, substance use is an adolescent onset disorder. About 90% of the people start using below the age of 20 and meet criteria by the age of 20. And its peak onset is during young adulthood. The red line there is showing the percent of people with the disorder not receiving any treatment. So it's very high rates of unmet needs. And you can see across the bottom there, they're all over 90% of the people who have a substance use disorder are not getting treatment. And the rates are lower for adults. When you look at kids, 94%, young adults about 95%, there are much higher rates of unmet need for treatment. If I look at that in Florida, I see a similar pattern in terms of the prevalence, but an even larger health disparity where adolescents in Florida are even less likely to get any kind of addiction treatment. If I look just within the teens overall, you can see that Florida has a very similar prevalence, 5.1, it actually has a higher prevalence of substance use disorders, but has a lower rate of treatment and therefore a higher unmet need of treatment. Now to put this in perspective for you, I've compared it with major health conditions on the far left there, mood disorders in the middle, and then substance use disorders on the right. This level of unmet need is one of the worst of every major chronic condition out there. Okay, So it's much worse than you would see for health conditions, and it's much worse than you see for mental health conditions. If I look at the trend in Florida, these are the number of admissions in Florida, you can see that it peaked in about 2011 and then has been coming down. So even though you've got this huge unmet need, the number of publicly funded admissions in Florida has actually been declining for the last several years. And the blue bar there is a percent. So it happened in about 2008, a lot of the treatment admissions started going down because of the recession. So it's not an uncommon phenomenon, but as a, both as a raw number and as a percent of all public admissions, Florida's treatment admissions for adolescents have been declining. If I look at the pattern of use, because this is sort of controlling for the number of youth, you can see that across all five years, continues to primarily be marijuana and alcohol are the two main substances that adolescents present for, uh, both in Florida and in the United States. You do see some stimulants. They're actually rising over time. This includes cocaine under DSM-5. Cocaine was collapsed back into other stimu into stimulants. Oddly enough, although we often talk about opioids and the opioid crisis, the number of admissions for opioids over that period of time actually declined. If I compare it to the U.S., you can see that it's a very similar pattern, and if anything, the opioid use in Florida among teens is actually a little bit lower than what you see in the rest of the United States. Same with stimulants. So even though stimulants have been coming up, it's still lower than what you see across the U.S. as a whole. If I look at it by level of care, this is a place where you see a pretty big difference. You can see that the outpatient admissions are declining, virtually no uh, intensive outpatient. Detox has been growing, which is very short-term stabilization. And then residential dropped, but then has been, as a percent of admissions, relatively stable. The raw number is declining with everything else, but the percent has stayed stable. If I compare this to the United States, the system is predominantly outpatient, 
But notice that in the rest of the United States, there's usually a, a fair amount of intensive outpatient. It's not here in, in Florida because of the way the regulations and the reimbursement is set up, but that's something sort of different about the state. But in contrast, the rest of the country doesn't usually use detox for kids. That's a relatively rare thing, whereas it's a common thing here. And then we have lower than average rates of residential here than what you would see in the rest of the United States. If I look at the lengths of stay, the percent that with a less than 30 day length of stay, that rise in detox has also led to a rise in short term admissions where they're not staying very long. And if I compare that though, that's a change in Florida, but if I compare the most recent year to the rest of the United States, it's not that different. It's actually coming more in line with lengths of stay elsewhere. If I look at the discharge status, about 50% are stay, about the majority of them are being successfully discharged here on the left. But you can see there's a big change where in the last year there was kind of a shift towards more transfers as opposed to uh, just continuing to complete it. Because actually the rates of uh, discharge against professional advice has gotten lower. If you look at the relative to the rest of the country, you see much higher rates of transfers in Florida than you see elsewhere. And again, that's probably partly due to the higher number of detox. You also see much lower rate, rates of the negative. And one of the things that's sort of a nice thing, it's a relatively rare thing to look at, but when you have enough data, you can look at it. The number of deaths while in treatment is actually much lower in Florida than what you see on average in the United States. So this is deaths per 10,000 kids in treatment. Now, one of the things you need to recognize about Florida is, is that it's very geographically diverse. So these are looking at population densities, and they're just not the same as you go around the different states. It has counties both above and below the national average of 88 people per square mile. Uh, while the rates of adolescent substance use overall don't vary much by county, the drugs that they do use do have pockets. There are places where you'll see an outbreak of a particular drug or a supplier. If I look at it and compare it to the rest of the United States, the big thing here would be that in Florida, Although you have that variability, when you look at most of the research I'm going to present you is from all over the United States, you can see that Florida is kind of in the mix of what's around the United States. So to summarize this first section, the key points are that adolescents and young adults have high rates of substance use disorders and more unmet need for treatment than adults or adolescents with mental health or health problems. The size of the adolescent treatment system in the U.S. has been getting smaller but Florida is shrinking faster. While Florida adolescent admissions uh, for stimulants are less than the U.S. average, they are growing as a percentage of admissions. Publicly funded treatment in Florida is less likely to be outpatient and residential and more likely to be detox and rarely intensive outpatient. Florida has a lower average length of stay but better discharge status and fewer deaths. Florida continues uh, counties are diverse in population density but well within the U.S. averages. Thus much of the research to date is germane to adolescent treatment in Florida. I'm gonna pivot now and talk about the recommendations. Before I go through all the data that gets to them, I'm gonna give you the end before the beginning so you know where we're going. So the National Institute on Dr uh, Drug Abuse convened a panel and built a series of recommendations based on a series of literature reviews. And these are basically the bottom line of what they recommended. Adolescent substance use needs need to be identified and addressed as soon as possible. Adolescents can benefit from drug abuse intervention even if they are not addicted to a drug yet. Routine annual medical visits are an opportunity to ask adolescents about drug use. Legal interventions and sanctions or family pressure may play an important role in getting adolescents to enter and stay and complete treatment. Substance use disorders treatment should be tailored to the unique needs of the adolescent. Treatment should address the needs of the whole person rather than just focusing on his or her drug use. Behavior therapies are effective in addressing adolescent drug use. Families and communities are an important aspect of treatment. Effectively treating substance use disorders in adolescents requires also identifying and treating any other mental health conditions they may have. Sensitive issues such as violence and child abuse or the risk of suicide should be identified and addressed. It is important to monitor drug use during treatment. Staying in treatment for an adequate period of time and con continuity of care after treatment are also important. Testing adolescents for sexually transmitted diseases like HIV as well as hepatitis B and C are an important part of drug treatment. Across these substantive areas, NIDA has recommended using standardized screeners, clinical assessment, evidence-based treatment, and practices wherever possible. Some key points from these recommendations, 
that were that they were built on prior consensus panels of uh, by drug strategies, meta-analyses funded by NIAAA, research reviews, and practice-based data for, by SAMHSA. They are consistent with the subsequent recommendations put out by OJJDP for juvenile drug courts, though the latter also includes more recommendations measuring recidivism and heart targeting high-risk youth. These recommendations are also consistent with data that are relevant for Florida system of care. So let's now turn and say, well, why, where do these recommendations come from? None of them are particularly radical, but I want to show you sort of why this is. This is epidemiological data showing you the rates of substance use disorder in dark red and then heavy use or other drug use in orange. And what you can see there along the bottom is age, that 90% of people who have substance use disorders in their lifetime started using during adolescence. 90% met criteria by 20. Okay, this is an adolescent, on, primarily an adolescent onset disorder. They get better. The vast majority will stop using. But that left side is in couple year increments, the right side is in decades. It takes a long time for them to get better. And the reason why this is so important is that people with substance use disorders die an average of 22 years younger than people without them. So this is a pretty significant public health problem. If I look at the years from your first use to when you quit among people showing to treatment, the median is 27 years. They use half the people will use more than 27 years before they stop. The younger they start, the longer they will use. So early onset is actually a pretty negative prognostic factor. The good news is that if we get there early, and that early just means the first nine years of use, basically adolescence and young adulthood, we cut the decades of use by 57%. That's a pretty good argument for, for screening and outreach and intervention, early intervention. If I go out and I measure the kids, and this is actually using household data, and I just take the five items, because the gain items for this actually come from the National Household Survey on Drug Abuse. If I just take five items of substance use disorder and divide up the population based on what they have it. You may have seen this pyramid in a public health class, but this is actual real data, not a theoretical pyramid. You can see about 6% are in that high disorder range, about 9% in the moderate, and about 86% of the teens aged 12 to 17 don't appear to really have any symptoms of a substance use disorder. Why that matters is, is that if I look across health problems, mental health problems, missing work, any school problems, justice system involvement, violence, multiple, just counting up the number of these problems, uh, multimorbidity, high health care costs, all of them go up. These are five questions. A five question screener could discriminate all these things in a household sample of 12 to 17 year olds. The high group is more likely than the low group to have high health care costs being 7,600 or more dollars. So these are pretty, it has, when you talk about trying to regulate health care costs, you can identify in five questions people at high likelihood of incurring emergency room admissions, hospitalizations, and other high expensive costs. There are systems of care that have taken this kind of screening system-wide. So in Washington State, the state mandated the use of this screener across all substance use, mental health, child welfare, justice, and school-based programs for both adults and adolescents. So they actually have a one-page screener that's being used across all of them. And the interesting thing about this is these are the rates of having any disorder a mental health disorder, a substance use disorder, and co-occurring. And Washington State is very interested in co-occurring because that's who drives the costs. So the people with co-occurring both substance use and mental health are, tend to be the ones that have the highest health care costs. So they're, we're very interested in finding a way to quickly find it. So one of the things you notice is that the problems could be easily identified. These are high rates of problems within five minutes doing a 15-item screener. This is on the left, the same five item screener, the gain SS done quickly right at the beginning. And on the right, the light purple, is everything in the record after two and a half to three years identifying co-occurring disorders. Every psychiatric assessment, drug test, psychological test, and everything. It turns out it isn't that hard to find co-occurring disorders. It's actually pretty easy. The hard part is treating it. The easy part is finding them. So this was basically showing that they could very rapidly across systems of care 
identify high rates of co-occurring disorders. The other thing is, is that because you had the same data from all the systems of care, they could go in the other direction and they could say, where are the people with disorders in our state system? And one of the things that was sort of interesting is this big pink bar right here in the middle was a part of their system that no one in the state ever talked about or ever thought about, which was the student assistance program. Turns out almost a third of the behavioral health clients were in the student assistance program. And they only thought of it as a prevention program and we're going to wipe it out. But that slide make them actually not, it made them change their mind and decide not to wipe it out because they were able to show that, the, that a third of their kids were being serviced there. And not just substance use, because of their mental health disparity for low level mental health, it's very hard to get services. The primary source, when you look at mental health, it's actually one of the bigger ones because that's the only place they could get behavior health for mental health was in schools. If you wanted to screen for kids and find kids who are not in treatment, while it's true that kids with substance use disorders have higher rates of dropout, over 95% of the kids with substance use disorders have been in school at some point during the past year. So the best single place to find kids with substance use disorders is in school. Much less you could find uh, in uh, some states, uh, in, in uh, some states it's typically like 13, 10%. But in six states, California, New Mexico, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Vermont, Washington, they're actually getting about 25% of the referrals to publicly funded treatment from schools. If we look at the juvenile justice system, one of the things that you see is, is that the kids in the juvenile justice system tend to have much higher rates of substance use disorders in the orange there than the kids not in the juvenile justice system. They're also much more likely to start treatment. They're still not getting there. Of all the kids with substance use disorders, they're not getting in that much, but they still do better than the national sample. Once they get in, they do just as well. So their rates of, of engaging for at least six weeks and, and continuing care are very similar to kids from the community. So it's sort of actually another opportunity place. Not a lot of kids in the justice system, but they have much higher rates of need and the system supports linkage to treatment. So key points, SUDs are primarily an adolescent onset chronic disorder that can last for decades, but have high rates of long-term remission. Early intervention and significantly reduces the time to remission. Identification of SUD and other mental health disorders can be done with very short screeners. SUD are related to a wide range of co-occurring problems and a high health care cost. School settings represent a key place to screen for SUD and provide treatment. Juvenile justice sees youth at particularly high risk of SUD and are one of the most common sources of referral, but face additional barriers to accessing care. So now let's turn to the treatment side. That's sort of all on the demand side and getting them to initiate and engage in treatment. But now once you get them there, what should you do? Well, there's been a big renaissance in treatment research for adolescents. Prior to uh, 1997, there are only about 16 published studies. Today, there are over several hundred. There are treatment manuals. There were no publicly available adolescent treatment manuals prior to 97. Now there's over 30. You see that there's been improvements in quality assurance, in standardized assessment, and participation rates, follow-up rates. Increasingly, there are experiments or quasi-experiments. There are multiple meta-analyses. Uh, there's one more actually coming out later this year, uh, as well as there have been cost and economic analyses. Some of the key results across these meta-analyses that keep coming up again and again is the treatment in adult programs and boot camps is associated with negative effects, two things that are still being done in multiple states on a regular basis. Contrary to some early speculation, there is no negative effect of group-based treatment. There was some discussion about could groups cause iatrogenic effects, but the data was from unstructured contact among kids with substance use disorders, not from group therapy. Group therapy is actually associated with a little better than average outcome. Treatment as usual, which is the vast majority of what's out there, is no better than prevention education alone or no treatment. However, a wide range of more evidence-based treatments, EBTs, do significantly better with family-based EBTs doing even a little better than that still. Effective EBTs are characterized by being developmentally appropriate, 
using motivation, cognitive and behavior modification theory, and in the best cases involving families. Similarity of outcomes among EBTs makes looking at their cost very important. Some of the problems with adolescent SUD treatment as usual are that among the adolescents who make it to treatment as usual, less than half are discharged successfully. Less than half stay in treatment for 90 days or more recommended by researchers. They are trans less than half are transferred to any kind of continuing care when they're stepped down from residential or higher levels of care. They rarely have access to recovery support services and they rarely make it 90 days without relapse. So this is kind of the problems with treatment as usual. Less than a, a third of those with co-occurring disorders receive any mental health treatment in the first 90 days. So even though you identified it in the assessment, it's rare for them to actually get anything to address it. Publicly funded criteria, uh, public treatment programs for adolescents only met six of the 14 quality indicators that SAMHSA uses to judge the quality of care, so less than half. Just want to show you now an example of the similarity of the clinical outcomes. This is from the Cannabis Youth Treatment Study, and there were two experiments, each comparing three types of treatment. The main thing to understand is those differences are not statistically significant. They're doing very similar across the conditions. But down here, the bar is not at zero days. The bar is treatment as usual. All, all, all of them were doing significantly better than treatment as usual. If I look at their cost, because they don't cost the same amount, there is significant differences in their cost effectiveness with the two briefer, less expensive ones doing much better than one that layered another layer of, of family therapy on top of it. Individual therapy was actually cheaper, more cost effective than group therapy. Everybody says, well, group therapy is so cheap, right? But when you have adolescent treatment, transportation, group formation is complicated and expensive. So getting a bunch of kids to one place for a group actually cost more money than the group session. <laughs> so it was cheaper to treat them individually than to try to port them all because somebody's thinking only about the billing rate for the group. If I look at family therapy, this is trying to add family therapy on top of another type of treatment. This is an integrated family therapy where they're doing MDFT, where they're doing treatment as part of family therapy. And so an integrated family therapy approach was more cost effective than trying to add it on top of something else. So again, this is just an example of how the similarity of outcomes makes you want to look at the cost and the cost effectiveness of these different interventions. If I, we talk about schools, well, the school-based treatment works pretty well, too. It actually does as equal to or a little better than when you're doing it in a community-based setting. One of the things that you got to work on is how do I get into schools? Why would the school let me in? Well, this is looking at changes in standardized education performance measures as a function of change in their substance use. So the green bar there is people who reduce their symptoms of substance use disorder on a five-item scale and they get their standardized test scores go up. Whereas if they don't reduce it or they actually get worse, their standardized test scores go down. That effect difference is larger than the average educational program designed to improve scores and is occurring over a matter of months. So that's a pretty decent effect size. And when you talk to a principal about improving standardized performance, that actually turns their head a little bit. It also is interesting that I can look at language usage and mathematics, and both of them showed significant improvement. So it wasn't just the overall standardized score. It was absenteeism, language, mathematics. It was broad-based. After residential treatment, I like to say that a residential treatment is only as good as its uh, community reentry program. You can do the best work in the world, and if you throw them back into a cesspool, it's not going to work. So this is looking at different types of, of uh, continuing care. And you can see usual continuing care all of them, actually, if you got them usual continuing care, save money. But usual continuing care saves less than if you introduce contingency management or assertive continuing care. The curious thing is, is that if you give them both, they actually do worse. This is actually something Kathy Carroll has seen with adults, too. That simply layering things on one on top of another doesn't actually tend to have an additive benefit. If you don't integrate something, it can backfire on you. 
particularly in terms of cost effectiveness. Another thing, a lot of my work is on managing addiction over time. I do a lot of longitudinal studies. So this is looking at the quarterly movement. On average, in any 90 days, kids are changing between these four statuses, using in the community, incarceration, treatment, and being in recovery. They move in all possible directions. Change occur is not the same in each direction. And treatment is not a panacea, but it does increase the probability of your entering recovery and staying there better than, than the other choices. The question that you often want to say then is, is, well, if there's so much movement there, can I predict it? Can I what pr predict what makes adolescents enter recovery and stay there? And it turns out I can. The po positive protective factors are things that when, if I reach them younger, females, racial minorities actually have higher rates of success and staying there. Uh, recent treatment, number of drug screens, attending 12-step meetings, positive social peers, positive recovery environments, school attendance. But notice on the risk factors, they're not all the opposite. So recent treatment is good, but repeated treatment is a bad prognosis. If you keep relapsing and having to go back, if I didn't do an adequate job that first time, if I didn't stay in the game with you, I'm actually making you less resilient. Same thing with school and work. A lot of times people like to treat little kids like little adults. Say, oh, let's get them employed. But what kind of job does a teenager get? They get a part-time job in a fast food restaurant where a lot of people are likely to use. It's not always a good thing. So employment is actually a negative risk factor for adolescents. You don't want to shove them right into a part-time job unless you know that that work environment is relatively safe. So some key points. A wide range of evidence-based treatment and recovery support practices have consistently demonstrated that they do better on average than treatment as usual, education only, or no treatment. It's important to also look at the cost effectiveness and the long-term pathways to recovery are often complicated but predictable. So what are some of the general predictors of bigger treatment effects? Assessment and triage to focus on the highest severity subgroup. Who needs suicide prevention? Somebody who's got suicidal thoughts. Who needs anger management? Somebody with anger issues. Isn't really rocket science. But if you try to give everything to everybody, you get a weaker effect. When you target your intervention at the people for whom it's intended, you get better effects. A strong intervention protocol based on prior literature. Quality assurance and performance monitoring to ensure the protocol is actually followed. Proactive case management of the individual. When you look at all the different problems that they have, you often need case management because they have multiple issues. If I look, this is from uh, Mark Lipsy's uh, meta-analysis of juvenile justice programs, and I count how many of those four things you have. The median is one. But as you go from none to four, you see about a 36-point change in the rates of recidivism. So having those four things really matters. When we talk about evidence-based practices, there's, a, there's an alphabet soup. There's not really great evidence that any one of them is radically better than the other, but there's a lot of them out there. If I grade them based on their evidence on the left, and then the degree of implementation, this is for translational research, more what we're talking about across the top, the worst one implemented well does as well as the best one implemented badly. So that what you want to do is, of course, if you can do the best one well, you get the biggest effect. But if you can't do that, the recommendation in general is to do the best one that you can afford to do well. So you find, you look at the ranking, but if it says you got to have two PhD level family therapists in every session and you don't have that kind of workforce or budget, that's not really the one you should use. You should pick the one that you can afford to implement well, because otherwise you're just sort of wasting money. And this is just taking one intervention and looking at what happens when you train people. That this is the improvement in outcome, 4%, versus when you train and coach counselors how to do it. You see a six-fold increase in the size of the effect. Coaching is essential. We are human beings. We do not learn something by sitting in a room and hearing it once. You have got to have people practice, train, and get feedback so that they can learn to do something well and incorporate it into their own practice. Some other factors that have been shown to produce better outcomes in adolescence, motivational interviewing, brief interventions work very well because a lot of kids don't connect the dots well. Developmentally, they are still in very concrete thinking. They don't have abstract. They don't have 
connecting the long-term consequences, prize-based contingency management, behavior therapies, family therapies, self-guided change, continuing care, smartphone-based recovery. Teens do really well with smartphones. Uh, working therapeutic alliance and treatment satisfaction, family, peer, and other environmental factors. So these are not meta-analyses haven't said that, but they're individual studies that say those things have shown some differential effect. Key messages. There are multiple other general factors that predict outcomes as much as the type of treatment. Targeting those mo most in need of service, use of evidence-based treatment, use of fidelity, base quality assurance and program monitoring, case management of multiple co-occurring problems and services, and some studies suggest the key roles of multiple specific interventions that I just talked about. So let me stop there. I got five minutes stopping and see if you have any questions. So you mentioned youth in juvenile justice that had um, as good outcomes for engagement and continuing care than ones who were not in juvenile justice. Right. Uh, when you factor in the sort of coercion sort of uh, element that they're under supervision and so they're required either as a condition of probation or diversion to be there, um, when we look at follow-up, say how many are clean and sober after three months or six months after they're no longer on supervision, does, does, there, does that have an effect? You know, like they're and they no longer have to be there. Yeah, yeah, there's not really great data on that with kids. There is with adults, and with adults, civil commitment actually had positive effects. Um, with kids, I've never seen a study that did what you asked, the question you asked. That data was from TEDS, which ends at discharge, so, so it doesn't go out. after they're off probation? Kind of no, the public treatment system only does intake and discharge. Right, right. Yeah? Um, I kind of have two questions. So it's really no secret that once someone is on substances, it's a vicious cycle. They do substances, they go to jail, they spend time there, they come out, they do substances, they go to jail, it just like continues and continues. Um, I was curious, one, is there usually interventions always implemented while they're in the juvenile justice system? And my second question is, if not, why aren't they being offered? And do you ever see a direction of services being implemented in jails or so the answer is, well, if you've seen five juvenile justice systems, you've seen six models. <laughs> so there's, there's nothing uniform about the juvenile justice system across the United States. Um, there, there are places that have treatment programs in juvenile justice. More common would be that juvenile justice might bring someone in or the most common would be that they would refer, they might screen. Most juvenile justice screen, but then they would refer for behavioral health services and partner with a community provider who would sometimes come in more often than not, would meet them outside in a different place and provide services. Um, and even in regular community supervision, there's a fairly high rate of that. Um, it's interesting, you don't think about it, but diversion in the justice system means diversion from the justice system, not to treatment. So the kids that are more likely to get referred to treatment are the ones who are actually on community supervision. And if they're in diversion or informal supervision, it usually means they're in a holding tank where if they don't get in trouble again, it's going to be wiped and they're going to let them go. They don't want to pull them too far. They don't want to, they view it as harmful to pull them further into the juvenile justice system. So the ones who are typically being referred to treatment are already in probation or even parole. Genetic predisposition and family history um, as, as a predictive factor? So there, there, the answer is all of the above. <laughs> so there is a gen genetic predisposition. Uh, it is environmental. It matters if you're in an environment where there isn't a lot around, you get less use, right? They don't go on and become addicted. It's also developmental. So. If I first use marijuana, which is relatively innocuous if you started using it over 21, but if my first use is under the age of 15, I'm six times more likely to become addicted to it. So the developmental consequences, the brain development, consequences of timing matters. So there is a propensity, but 
when you use it, what's around you. If it's not around you, you're never going to use it. But most kids will say it's readily available and around them, so it's hard to avoid it. But then it becomes a question of timing. And in, with marijuana in particular, there's also a risk of a, a increasingly well-established risk for if you had a propensity to have schizophrenic symptoms, that the onset of schizophrenia can be accelerated by exposure to marijuana. So it's not actually the marijuana that they're necessarily getting addicted to, but the marijuana can trigger progression to schizophrenia. Sorry, you said that 80% uh, of programs are only using 6 of 14 indicators for successful programs? The, at national average. National average. The so national average for the SAMHSA 14 indicators is that 6 of them are meeting it. What? So they're meeting 6 criteria. What's the literature say is the, the greatest you know, barriers to, to rectifying that? And, and are, are, is there an anticipated amount of time it's going to take before uh, dissemination and implementation uh, correct that? Uh, it has been changing, and actually juvenile justice is ahead of most places because they have more severe kids and they have their own money and some other things, and they're not that big. Um, now it's among the, if you look at the primary providers used by juvenile justice, over 80% of them are using evidence-based practices. If you look at all adolescent treatment programs in the United States, it's less than half. So, but a juvenile justice agent like a parent is going to shop around <laughs> and find who's doing the best job in the community. They're going to try to find, they're going to try to negotiate and buy, buy up. Because it doesn't really actually cost more to use evidence-based treatments. They actually are more effective and more cost-effective. But it's, it is changing, it is improving, it is going painfully slowly. And since 2008, it'll be the next presentation, you'll see that the size of the treatment system has been shrinking. And there's been a retrenchment because of budget. People didn't have the money after the recession. And the current focus is on opioids, which it should be, but the adolescents are being left behind. There was a big push to focus on adolescents a decade ago, 20 years ago, and now that's sort of being left in the dust in the urgency of dealing with opioids. It's not like it's a either or. You either get it early or you get it late. You know, you, but it's right now. It's not the priority. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got